On YouTube, I watched a Mac user who had bought an iMac last year. It was maxed out with 40 gigabits of RAM, costing around $4,000. He watched in disbelief how his hyper-intensive iMac was being demolished by this new M1 Mac Mini, which he had paid a measly $700 for. In real-world tests after tests, the M1 Macs are not merely itching past top-of-the-line Intel Macs. They're destroying them. In this belief, people have started asking how on earth this is possible. If you were one of these people, you have come to the right place. Here, I plan to break it down into digestible pieces, exactly what is the Apple has done with the M1. Specifically, the questions I think a lot of people have are, what are the technical reasons this M1 chip is so fast? And has Apple made some really exotic technical choices to make this possible? To answer these questions, first, let's see what's a microprocessor or a CPU. Normally, when speaking of chips from Intel and AMD, we talk about central processing unit or CPUs or microprocessors. These pull in instructions from memory, then each instruction is typically carried out in sequence. A CPU at its most basic level is, is a device with a number of named memory cells called registers and a number of computational units called arithmetic logic units or ALU. The ALUs perform things like addition, subtraction, and other basic math operations. However, these are only connected to the CPU registers. So if you want to add up two numbers, you have to get these two numbers from memory and into two registers in the CPU. Here are some examples of typical instructions that our RISC CPU, as found on the MU, carries out. Here, R1 and R2 are the registers I talked about. Modern RISC CPUs cannot do operations on numbers that are not in registers like this. For example, it cannot add two numbers residing in RAM in two different locations. Instead, it has to pull these two numbers into a separate register. That is what we do in this simple example. We pull in the number at memory location 150 in the run and put it into register R1 in the CPU. Next, we put the contents of address 200 into register R2. Only then can the numbers be added with the add R1 plus R2 instruction. The concept of registers is old. For example, on this old mechanical calculator, the register is what holds the numbers you are adding. Like the origin of the term cache register, the register is where you register input numbers. So now that you know what's a microprocessor or a CPU, we can go over M1. Surprisingly enough, the M1 is not a CPU. It's a whole system of multiple chips put in into one large silicon package. The CPU is just one of these chips. Basically, the M1 is one whole computer onto a chip. The M1 contains a CPU, a graphic processing unit or GPU, memory, input and output controllers, and many more things making it a whole computer. This is what we call a system on a chip or SOC. Today, if you buy a chip, whether from Intel or AMD, you actually get what amounts to multiple microprocessors in one package. In the past, computers would have multiple physical separate chips on the motherboard of the computer, as you can see here. However, because we're able to put so many transistors on a silicon die today, companies such as Intel and AMD began putting multiple microprocessors onto one chip. Today we refer to these chips as CPU cores. One core is basically a full independent chip that can read instructions from memory and perform calculations. And this has been for a long time the name of the game in terms of increasing performance. Just add more general purpose CPU cores. But there is a disturbance in the force. There is one player in the CPU market that's deviating from this trend. And you know who it is. 
So let's talk about this player, and it's not so secret heterogeneous computing strategy. Instead of adding ever more general purpose CPU cores, Apple has followed another strategy. They have started adding ever more specialized chips, doing a few specialized tasks. The benefit of this is that specialized chips tend to be able to perform these tasks significantly faster using much less electric current than a general purpose CPU core. This is not entirely new knowledge. For many years, already specialized chips such as the graphical processing units or GPUs have been sitting in NVIDIA and AMD graphics cards, performing operations related to graphics much faster than general purpose CPUs. What Apple has done is simply to take a more radical shift towards this direction. Rather than just having general purpose cores and memory, the M1 contains a wide variety of specialized chips. Let's go over them. The central processing unit, or CPU. The brains of the system on chip. Run, it runs most of the code of the operating system and your apps. The graphics processing unit, or GPU. It handles graphics related tasks, such as visualizing an app's user interface and 2D and 3D gaming. The image processing unit, or ISP. It can be used to speed up common tasks done by image processing applications. The digital signal processor, or DSP. It handles more mathematically intensive functions than a CPU. It includes the compressing music files. The Neural Processing Unit, or NPU. It's used in high-end smartphones to accelerate machine learning or AI tasks. These include voice recognition and camera processing. Video Encoder and Decoder. It handles the power-efficient conversion of video files and formats. The Secure Enclave. It handles encryption, authentication, and security. And last but not least, the Unified Memory. It allows the CPU, GPU, and other cores to quickly exchange information. Having all these different chips is part of the reason why a lot of people working on images and video editing with the M1 Max are seeing such speed improvements. A lot of the tasks they do can run directly on specialized hardware. That is what allows a cheap M1 Mac Mini to encode a large video file without breaking a sweat. My expensive iMac has all its fans going full blast and still cannot keep up. But Apple has a special sauce. It created its unified memory architecture. So what's so special about Apple's unified memory architecture? Apple's unified memory architecture is a bit tricky to wrap your head around. To explain why, we need to take a few steps back. For a long time, cheap computer systems have had the CPU and GPU integrated into the same chip, same silicon die. They have been famously slow. In the past, saying integrated graphics was essentially the same as saying slow graphics. These were slow for several reasons. Separate areas of this memory got reserved for the CPU and the GPU. The CPU had a chunk of data it wanted the GPU to use. It couldn't say, here, have some of my memory. No, the CPU had to explicitly copy the whole chunk of data over the memory area control by the GPU. CPUs and GPUs don't want their memory served the same way. Let's do a silly food analogy. CPUs want their plate of data served very quickly by the waiter, but they're totally cool with small portion sizes. Imagine a fancy French restaurant with waiters on rollerblades to serve you really quickly. GPUs, in contrast, are cool with the waiter being slow to serve the data. But the GPUs want enormous servings. They gobble massive amounts of data because they are massive parallel machines that can chew through lots of data in parallel. Imagine an American junk food place where the food takes some time to arrive because they're pushing a whole trolley of food to your sitting area. With such different needs, putting CPUs and GPUs on the same physical chip was not a great idea. 
the GPUs would sit there starving while given small French servings. The result was that there was no point in putting powerful GPUs on a system on chip. The tiny portions of data served up could easily be chewed up by a weak little GPU. And that's where Apple Unified Memory Architecture comes in place. Apple's Unified Memory Architecture tries to solve all these problems without having the disadvantage of old school shared memory. They achieve this in the following ways. There is no special area reserved just for the CPU or the GPU. Memory is allocated to both processors. They can both use the same memory. No copying is needed. Apple uses memory which serves both large chunks of data and serves it fast. In computer speak, that's called low latency and high throughput. Thus, the need to be connected to separate types of memory is removed. Apple has gotten the watt usage of the GPU down so that a relatively powerful GPU can be integrated without overheating the system on chip. Some will say unified memory is not entirely new. It's true that different systems have had in the past, but then the difference in memory requirements may not have been as large. Secondly, what NVIDIA calls unified memory is not really the same thing. In the NVIDIA world, unified memory simply means that there is software and hardware which takes care of automatically copying data back and forth between the separate CPU and GPU memory. Thus, from a programmer's perspective, Apple and NVIDIA Unified Memory may look the same, but it's not the same in a physical sense. There is of course a trade-off in this strategy. Getting this high bandwidth memory requires full integration, which means you take away the opportunity from customers to upgrade their memory. But Apple seeks to minimize this problem by making the communication with the SSD disks so fast that they are essentially work like old-fashioned memory. So, if what Apple is doing is so smart, why is not everybody doing it? To some extent, they are. Other ARM chip makers are increasingly putting in specialized hardware. AMD has also started putting stronger GPUs on some of their chips and moving gradually towards some form of system on chip. With the accelerated processing units, APUs, which are basically CPU cores and GPU cores placed on the same silicon die. Yet, there are important reasons why they cannot do this. A system on chip is essentially a whole computer on a chip. That makes it a more natural fit for an actual computer maker, such as HP and Dell. Let me clarify with a silly car analogy. If your business model is to build and sell car engines, it would be an unusual leap to begin manufacturing and selling whole cars. For ARM, in contrast, this isn't an issue. Computer makers such as Dell or HP could simply license ARM intellectual property and buy IP for other chips to add whatever specialized hardware they think their system on chip should have. Next, they ship the finished design over to a semiconductor foundry such as Global Foundries or TSMC, which manufactures chips for AMD and Apple today. But here we get a big problem with Intel and AMD business model. Their business models are based on selling general purpose CPUs, which people just slot onto a large PC motherboard. Thus, computer makers can simply buy motherboards, memory, CPUs, and graphic cards from different vendors and integrate them into one solution. But we're quickly moving away from that world. In the new system on chip world, you don't assemble physical components from different vendors. Instead, you assemble IP or intellectual property from different vendors. You buy the design for graphic cards, CPUs, modems, I.O. controllers and other things from different vendors and use that to design a system on chip in-house. Then you get a foundry to manufacture this. Now you got a big problem because neither Intel, AMD or NVIDIA are going to license their intellectual property to Dell or HP for them to make a system on chip for their machines. 
Sure, Intel and AMD may simply begin to sell whole finish system on chips. But what are these to contain? PC makers may have different ideas of what they should contain. You potentially get a conflict between Intel, AMD, Microsoft and PC makers about what sort of specialized chips should be included because these will need software support. But in the case of Apple, this is very simple. They control the whole widget. They give you, for example, the Core ML library for developers to write machine learning stuff. Whether Core ML runs on Apple CPU on the neural engine is an implementation detail developers don't have to care about. The fundamental challenge of making any CPU run fast. So, heterogeneous computing is part of the reason, but not the sole reason why M1s are so fast. The fast general purpose CPU cores on the M1 called Firestorm are genuinely fast. This is a major deviation from ARM CPU cores in the past which tended to be very weak compared to AMD and Intel cores. Firestorm in contrast beats most Intel cores and almost beats the fastest AMD Ryzen cores. Conventional wisdom said that that was not going to happen. Before talking about what makes Firestorm fast, it helps to understand what the core idea of making a fast CPU is really about. In principle, you accomplish in a combination of two strategies. Perform more instructions in a sequence faster, perform lots of instructions in parallel. Back in the 80s, it was easy. Just increase the clock frequency and the instructions would finish faster. Every clock cycle is when the computer does something, but this something can be quite literal. Thus, an instruction may require multiple clock cycles to finish because it's made up of several smaller tasks. However, today increasing the clock frequency is next to impossible. That's the whole end of Moore's law that people have been harping on over a decade now. Thus, it's really about executing as many instructions as possible in parallel. Multi-core or out-of-order processors. There are two approaches to this. One is to add more CPU cores. From the point of view of a software developer, it's like adding threads. Every CPU core is like a hardware thread. If you don't know what a thread is, then you can think of it as the process of carrying out a task. With two cores, a CPU can carry out two separate tasks concurrently. Two threads. The tasks could be described as two separate programs stores in memory, or it could actually be the same program performed twice. Each thread needs some bookkeeping, such as where in a sequence of program instructions the thread is currently at. Each thread may store temporary results, which should be kept separate. In principle, a processor can have just one core and run multiple threads. In this case, it simply hots one thread and stores current progress before switching to another. Later, it switches back. This doesn't bring much of a performance enhancement and is only used when a thread may frequently halt to wait for input from the user or data from a slow network connection, for example. These may be called software threads. Hardware threads mean you have actual extra physical hardware, such as extra cores at your disposal to speed things up. The problem with this is that the developer has to write code to take advantage of this. Some tasks, such as server software, are easy to write like this. You can imagine processing each connecting user separately. These tasks are so independent from each other that having lots of cores is an excellent choice for servers, specifically cloud-based services. This is the reason why ARM CPU makers such as Ampere, making CPUs such as the Ultra Max, which has a crazy 128 cores. This chip is specifically made for the cloud. You don't need crazy single core performance because in the cloud, it's all about having as many threads as possible per watt to handle as many concurrent users as possible. Apple, in contrast, is on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Apple makes single user devices. Lots of threads is not an advantage. Their devices are used for gaming, video game editing, development, etc. They want desktops with beautiful, responsive graphics and animations. Desktop software is generally not made to utilize lots of cores. For example, computer games will likely benefit from 8 cores, but something like 
128 cars would be a total waste. Instead, you want fewer but more powerful cars. So instead of using multiple cores, here's an interesting thing, out-of-order execution. Out-of-order execution is a way to execute more instructions in parallel without exposing that capability as multiple threads. Developers don't have to code their software specifically to take advantage of it. From the developer perspectives, it just looks like each core runs faster. To understand how this works, you need to understand some things about memory. Asking for data in one particular memory location is slow, but there's no difference in the delay getting one byte compared to getting, say, 128 bytes. Data is sent across what we call a data bus. To understand how this works, you need to understand some things about memory. Asking for data in one particular memory location is slow, but there's no difference in the delay getting one byte compared to getting, say, 128 bytes. Data is sent across what we call a data bus. You can think of it as a road or pipe between memory and different parts of the CPU where data gets pushed through. In reality, it's just, of course, just some copper tracks conducting electricity. If the data bus is wide enough, you can just get multiple bytes at the same time. Thus, CPUs get a whole chunk of instructions at a time to execute, but they are written to be executed one after the other. Modern microprocessors do what we call out-of-order execution. That means that they are able to analyze a buffer of instructions quickly and see which ones depend on which. Look at this simple example. Multiplication tends to be a slow process, so say it takes multiple clock cycles to perform. The second instruction will simply have to wait, because its calculation depends on knowing the result that gets put into the R1 register. However, the third instruction at line 03 doesn't depend on calculations from previous instructions. Hence, an out-of-order processor can begin calculating the instruction in parallel. However, more realistically, we're talking about hundreds of instructions. The CPU is able to figure out all the dependencies between these instructions. It analyzes the instructions by looking at the inputs to each instruction. Do the inputs depend on output from one or more other instructions? By input and output, we mean registers containing results from previous calculations. For example, the add R4, R15, instruction depends on input from R1, which is produced by multiplying R2 times R3 to get R1. We can chain together these relationships into a long elaborate graph that the CPU can work through. The nodes are the instructions and the edges are the registers connecting them. The CPU can analyze such a graph of nodes and determine which instructions it can perform in parallel and where it needs to wait for the results from multiple dependent calculations before carrying on. Many instructions will finish early, but we cannot make the results official. We cannot commit them, otherwise we supply the results in the wrong order. To the rest of the world, it has to look as if the instructions were carried out in the same sequence as they were issued. Like a stack, the CPU will keep popping done instructions from the top until hitting an instruction that's not done. We're not quite done with this explanation, but this gives you a bit of a clue. Basically, you can have parallelism that the programmer must know, or the kind which the CPU fakes to look as if everything is a single thread. However, behind the scenes is doing out-of-order black magic. It is the superior out-of-order execution that's making the Firestorm cars on the M1 kick ass and take names. It's in fact much stronger than anything from Intel or AMD. Likely stronger than anybody else in the mainstream market. So why is Apple out of order execution superior to AMD and Intel? In my explanation of out of order execution, I skipped some important details which need to be covered. Otherwise, it's not possible to understand why Apple is ahead of the game and Intel and AMD may not be able to catch up. The big scratch pad that I talked about is actually the reorder buffer, or ROB, and it doesn't contain normal machine code instructions, not the ones that the CPU fetches from memory to execute. These are the instructions in the CPU instruction set architecture, or ISA. That's the kind of instructions that we call x86, ARM, PowerPC, etc. 
However, internally the CPU works on an entirely different instruction set, invisible to the programmer. We call these micro operations or microps. The reorder buffer is full of these micro operations. These are much more practical to work with for all the magic a CPU does to make stuff run in parallel. The reason is that micro operations are very wide, contain a lot of bits and can contain all sorts of meta information. You cannot add that kind of information to an ARM or x86 instruction as it would totally bloat the program binaries, expose details about how the CPU works, whether it has an out-of-order unit, has register naming and many other details. A lot of this meta information only makes sense in the context of our current execution. You can think of this as when writing a program. You have a public API that needs to be stable and everybody uses. That's the ARM x86 PowerPC MIPS instruction sets. In contrast, the micro operations are basically the private APIs that are used to implement the public ones. Also, micro operations are usually easier to work with for the CPU. Why? Because they each do one simple limited task. Regular ISA instructions or instruction set architecture instructions can be more complex, causing a bunch of stuff to happen and thus actually translate to multiple micro operations. So an ISA instruction can contain multiple micro operations and micro operations are the ones contained in the ISA instructions. For CISC CPUs, there's usually no alternative but to use micro operations. Otherwise, the large complex CISC instructions would make pipelines and out of order executions next to impossible to achieve. And that's what Intel and AMD use. For the type of processor that Apple uses, RISC CPUs, they have a choice. So for example, ARM CPUs don't use micro operations at all, but that also means they cannot do things such as out of order. Apple's processor RISC CPUs have a choice. For example, ARM CPUs that are smaller used in phones, for example, don't use micro operations at all. But why does this matter? Why is this detail important to know to understand why Apple has the upper hand on AMD and Intel? Because the ability to run fast depends on how quickly you can fill up the reorder buffer with micro operations and with how many. The more quickly you fill it up and the larger it is, the more opportunities you are given to pick instructions you can execute in parallel and thus improve performance. Machine code instructions are chopped into micro operations, but we call an instruction decoder. If we have more decoders, we can chop up more instructions in parallel and thus fill the reorder buffer faster. And this is where we see the huge differences. The biggest, baddest Intel and AMD microprocessor cores have four decoders which means they can decode four instructions in parallel, spitting out micro operations. But Apple has a crazy eight decoders. But not only that, but their reorder buffer is something like three times larger. You can basically hold three times as many instructions. No other mainstream chip maker has that many decoders in their CPUs. Why can't Intel and AMD add more instruction decoders? This is where we finally see the revenge of RISC and where the fact that the M1 Firestorm core has an ARM RISC architecture begins to matter. This is where we finally see the revenge of RISC and where the fact that the M1 Firestorm core has an ARM RISC architecture begins to matter. You see, for x86 an instruction can be anywhere from 1 to 15 bytes long. On a RISC chip, instructions are fixed size. Why is that relevant in this case? Because splitting up a stream of bytes into instructions to feed into 8 different decoders in parallel becomes trivial if every instruction has the same length. However, on an x86 CPU, the decoders have no clue where the next instruction starts. It has to actually analyze each instruction in order to see how long it is. The brute force way Intel and AMD deal with this is by simply 
attempting to decode the instructions at every possible starting point. That means we have to deal with lots of wrong guesses and mistakes, which has to be discarded. This creates such a convoluted and complicated decoder stage that's really hard to add more decoders. But for Apple, it's trivial in comparison to keep adding more. In fact, adding more decoders causes so many other problems that four decoders, according to AMD itself, is basically an upper limit on how far they can go. This is what allows the M1 Firestorm course to essentially process twice as many instructions as AMD and Intel CPUs in the same clock frequency. One could argue, as a counterpoint, that CISC instructions turn into more micro-ops, that they are denser so that, for example, decoding one x86 instruction is more similar to decoding, say, two ARM instructions. Except that's not the case in the real world. Highly optimized x86 code rarely uses complex six instructions. In some regards, it has a risk flavor. But that doesn't help Intel or AMD, because even if those 15 byte long instructions are rare, the, the decoders have to be made to handle them. This incurs complexity that blocks AMD and Intel from adding more decoders. Wait, but AMD Zen 3 cores are still faster, right? As far as I remember from performance benchmarks, the newest AMD CPU cores, the ones called Zen 3, are slightly faster than Firestorm cores. But, but here's the kicker, that only happens because the Zen 3 cores are clocked at 5 GHz. On the other hand, Firestorm's cores are clocked at 3.2 GHz. The Zen 3 is just barely squeezing past Firestorm, despite having almost 60% higher clock frequency. So why doesn't Apple increase the clock frequency too? Because higher clock frequency makes the chips hotter. This is one of Apple's selling points. Their computers, unlike Intel and AMD offerings, rarely needs cooling. In essence, one could say Firestorm cores really are superior to Zen 3 cores. Zen 3 only manages to stay in the game by drawing a lot more current and getting a lot hotter. Something Apple simply chooses not to do. If Apple wants higher performance, they are simply going to add more cores. That lets them keep watt usage down while offering more performance. What about the future? It seems that Intel have painted themselves into a corner on two fronts. First, they don't have a business model that makes it easy to pursue heterogeneous computing and system on chip designs. Second, their legacy x86 6 instruction set is coming back to haunt them, making it harder to improve out of order performance. That doesn't mean game over. They can, of course, simply clock up more, use more cooling, throw in more cores, beef up the CPU caches, etc. But they are both at a disadvantage. Intel is in the worst situation, as their cores are already soundly beaten by Firestorm, and they have weak GPUs to integrate with a system-on-chip solution. The problem with throwing more cores is that for typical desktop workloads, you reach diminishing returns with too many cores. Sure, lots of cores are great for servers. However, here companies such as Amazon and Ampere are attacking with monster CPUs with 128 cores. That's like fighting the Western and Eastern front at the same time. But fortunately for AMD and Intel, Apple doesn't sell their chips on the market. So PC users will simply have to put with whatever they're offering. PC users may jump ship, but that's a slow process. You don't leave immediately a platform you're heavily invested in. But young professionals with money to burn without too deep investments in any platform may increasingly turn to Apple in the future, beefing up their hold on the premium market and in turn their share of the local profit in the PC market. I hope you like this video. Please don't forget to subscribe, like this video or leave any comments down below. Bye.